Hi guys, in this video we are going to talk about black box VI, BBVI, uh, which is a type of stochastic variational inference where the stochasticity comes from MC integration, just like in ADVI, automatic differentiation VI. The main source for this video is this paper uh, from 2014. And so we are in the general setting, meaning we are not limiting ourselves only to exponential family. And unlike in the previous video in ADVI, we don't assume we can use the reparameterization trick. So instead we use another trick which is called the log derivative. So I already gave a simple outline of the BBVI algorithm in my general SVI video. Uh, so let's just do a recap of that. We use the log derivative trick to simplify the gradient of the elbow. So we are interested in taking the gradient of the elbow and using the log derivative trick we will reach to this thing over here where basically the gradient becomes just the gradient of the log q. These terms are without the gradient and here we have an expectation. So basically we managed to push the gradient inside and even uh, some terms cancelled. So let's see how we did this. So this is the gradient inside the integral using Leibniz rule. We can push it inside the integral, inside the expectation basically. But note that both this depends on theta and these depends on theta. Okay, so we will use the product rule to get this and this. So at first we take the gradient of the first term times the second term without a gradient and then we take uh, the gradient of the second term times the first term without a gradient. Notice that the second term here in this equation is equal to zero. How do we show this? Well the first term doesn't depend on theta at all so it just cancels. Yeah. The second term the minus becomes this the derivative of the log becomes 1 over what's inside the log and then it's the inner derivative, right? So now these two cancel and we get to this. We can again switch between the integral and the gradient using Leibniz rule or reverse Leibniz rule. This is a valid distribution so it's just equal to 1. The gradient of 1 is just 0. So this whole thing cancels out and we are left without it. In the first term, we will use the log derivative trick. So instead of writing this, we will write it like this. Okay, and I already showed this in the previous video why it's correct. You can do it again. You just take the gradient of the log. It's just one over uh, the q and then the q and q cancel. And you are only left with the inner derivative, which is this thing. So what did we gain from this? We gained that we can now use MC integration and push the derivative into the expectation. So we have this now and we can consider this as if it's an expectation. So we reach the final form which we stated already in the beginning. Okay, now instead of an expectation we are going to replace it with MC integration. So we are going to sample ZIs from our variational family using the current value of the parameters of this variational family. And in time step zero the, we give it a random values. Yeah, we start with some random but plausible values yeah, so if the theta, if the parameter can only be positive, we have to give it a positive number. If it can, if it can only live in a certain domain, we have to give it a number that lives in that domain. So we start with some initial values in theta zero, and then in each time step, we, we sample from this variational family, the zi's, and given zi's, and given the current value of theta of our parameters of the variational family, we can compute a noisy version of the gradient of the elbow, right? So here, instead of an expectation, we'll get, we'll take the sample average and this, given the parameters and given the z's, we can calculate it. It's our, we chose this variational family. The joint or the likelihood times the prior, we are assuming we have access at least to the joint. So we can calculate this for a given zi and for a given data set that we have. And again, here it's the same thing, so we can calculate it. And then once we have this, we can do gradient descent. And again, the alphas can be either adaptive, they, they will usually be adaptive, but here just for simplicity, I'm not getting into this whole topic. So uh, we just update the next version of the parameters at time step t plus one will be equal to the parameters at time step t plus a step size times the gradient. Now, since the gradient suffers from too high variance due to the stochasticity from the MC integration, right? We replaced this expectation with a sampling. But each time we will sample, we will get a different gradient and the variance of this 
different gradient will be too high. So sometimes we might get a really big gradient and sometimes we might get a very small gradient. And this is not good. We want that the variance will be uh, relatively low so we can actually use this approximation instead of the actual number. So there are two methods that BBVI uses to reduce the variance. One is called raw blackwellization and the second is called control variance. So let's start with raw blackwellization. What it means, uh, the term, it means transforming something in order to reduce its variance. Now there is a theorem called raw blackwell which does exactly that, but it does it in a completely different scenario. So it's not related to what we are doing here, but because it also reduced the variance, we are kind of calling it raw blackwellization. So it's just a term that means we are reducing the variance. So writing the gradient of the elbow, it looks like this. And here I use the joint instead of breaking it into the likelihood times the prior, but they are the same. Now we want to focus on each component of the gradient separately. So suppose we have uh, D dimensions uh, of disease, and according to the mean field approximation, the Q of Z is the product of each Q theta I, Z I, right? We, we are giving each dimension its own distribution. So the question is, if we are now looking only at theta I, the gradient with regards to theta i, can we only sample from z i? And so the obvious answer is no, right? So the first term is uh, this. Once we take the gradient of that, okay, using the mean field assumption, then it becomes this thing, and then it becomes a vector of gradients. And if we only care about the i component, it's okay. We can just look at that and take that one. So here we don't have a problem, but here, uh, and here we do have a problem. These things don't depend only on zi. Here you could have more than just the zi. You can have zi plus one, zi minus one, etc. So does it mean that we have to sample all of the z's? And notice that sampling each z's will add to the overall variance of our MC estimator. So each time you sample a z, okay, you sample it from these variational family, but you're sampling it from some distribution. So you are getting some stochasticity, some randomness in it. So if we can minimize the number of z's that we are sampling, it will reduce the overall variance of this approximation. Okay, and this is exactly what we are going to do now. So we are going to do this using a few things, but the main thing is using the law of total expectation, which basically means we are breaking the joint, right? Because here we had the expectation over Q of all of the z's, but using the mean field approximation, we said, that it factors into the product of these Q1, Q2, until QD. And the law of total expectation says we can now factor out the expectations. So we can say it's the expectation with regards to Q1 times the expectation with regards to all the other Qs, which I denote by Q minus one. And this is for Q1, but of course it generalized to any I, right? So we first expand the Qs using the mean field approximation. So we start with this. And now instead of this, we are writing it like this, right? Because we will have the log of the product, which will turn into the sum of the logs. Okay, so we will get this thing, the same for here, yeah? This term and this term. Now when we take the gradient of this, so all the distribution of the zj's that are not zi will disappear and we will only get the distribution of zi, which is parameterized by theta i. So this is how we get from here to here. The next thing we are going to do is we are going to look at the p at the joint and we are going to break it to terms that contain zi and terms that don't contain zi. We will denote by pi the terms that contain zi and by p minus i the terms that don't contain zi. Now notice it doesn't mean the terms that contain zi, it doesn't mean that they only contain zi, they could also contain other terms. For example suppose that the joint is this bivariate normal, if we don't look at normalizing constant we get these things over here. If we now open this and we ignore things that only contain Z2, but we keep everything that still contains Z1, we will get these terms over here. But notice that here we have a term that contains both Z1 and Z2. And so now this will be called P1. The rest of the terms will be called P minus one. The log of this will be equal to this plus the P minus one, the log of P minus one. But it doesn't mean that this thing only contains Z1. We still have this Z2 here that is not Z1. Okay, so it's something to keep in mind. Okay, so this is exactly what we did. We factored the P, the joint, into Pi times P minus I. And because it's a log, it becomes this thing over here. 
And now we are going to use the law of total expectation. I wrote it like this. Another thing I did is I broke down this sum from the sum over all j to the i-th component plus all the other terms. Okay, and now notice that all the other terms here and also log of uh, everything that doesn't contain the i, these terms, when we take them out and look at the whole expression, they will zero out. And this is because they don't depend on the i. So let's denote the expectation of them by ci. Okay, so I right now I'm on. So right now I'm only focusing on these two terms, and we are going to see what's going to happen to them. We'll go back. We'll get back to the other terms in a second. So focusing only on them and denoting them by ci, we get this thing over here. This thing does not depend on zi, right? Here we only have zjs, and here we only have stuff that do not depend on zi by definition. Okay, so expanding the expectation it becomes this thing since it doesn't depend on the i we can take it out and this is basically the expectation of the score and the expectation of the score is always zero right because this thing will become one over q theta zi yeah it will cancel with this we will only be left with the derivative of q theta i zi dzi we can replace again the integral if the derivative, the integral will then become one and the derivative of one will become zero. And so we get that it's equal to zero. So in the end, we are left only with these two terms. So let's continue with them. So this is what we've got. And notice that the expectation is actually only on here because here again, it's, it only contains zi and here it's the expectation with everything except zi. So it becomes this. And as mentioned earlier, pi could contain more than just zi. But note that it might not contain all of the zi. So it can contain more than zi, but it doesn't have to contain all of the zi's. So let's denote by q minus i the variational distribution of all the z's that are still in pi except zi. Okay. So now we can replace here the expectation with regards to everything except zi to everything that is still in pi except zi. So we replaced this by this. And what I mean here is let's suppose that we have z1, z2, and z3. We are now looking only at the derivative with regards to theta1. Yeah, so q theta1 of z1. And pi, or p1 in this case, only contains z1 and z2. Okay, so these things are the only things that are still in p1. So we don't have to take the expectation here with regards to z2 and z3 it's enough to take just with z2. Okay, so here we should have taken with everything except uh, z1, so it's z2 and z3, but because the only terms that are in pi are z1 and z2, we don't need to take the expectation with regards to z3, it will just disappear anyway. So this is what is meant by moving from here to here. And now we can reverse the law of total expectation to pull this outside and we'll get this thing over here. And now if we also add qi into the q minus i, what does it mean? It means the variational distribution of all z's that are still in pi, but this time including zi. We will get this thing over here. And now we will replace the expectation with mc integration. And what it means is we need to sample from qi. We need to sample all kinds of samples. Let's say we sample big S number of samples and uh, the z little s will denote the individual samples. And this is what we'll get in the end, where this means that we are only looking at the i dimension. So we are only looking at the actual z. So basically, we are only looking at zi out of the zs's that we sampled. So continuing with the example from here, zs will be of z1 and z2. Here we only look at z1, here we look at z1 and z2 because we said both of them are in p1. And here we are only looking at z1. Okay, so this is raw block realization and this is, and this is how we cancel terms in the gradient that are not absolutely crucial to it. And because we don't have to sample them or we sample them maybe for other derivatives, but for this single derivative, we don't have to use them. Then it lowers the variance of the derivative with regards to theta i. So this was one method. Another method uh, that is used is called control variates. And this was actually the method that was suggested 
by this paper from 2013. And as I mentioned in the review on SVI, this paper and the BBVI paper both use the log derivative trick and they both mention the problem with the variance. This paper seems to suggest using control variates, if I understand it correctly, but I don't see that it actually explained it and the BBVI paper actually explained it. So let's see what it is. So let's denote the real MC approximated gradient. Yeah, this thing, let's denote it by f of z as a function of some z. Because we saw it depends on the certain z's that we sample. And instead of this quantity, we will use another quantity. So we won't use this gradient, we will use another quantity, another gradient, which will be a bit different, but will satisfy two conditions. The expectation of this other quantity will be exactly like the expectation of this thing, which we wanted to use. And the variance of this other quantity will be, will be lower than the variance of this, or at least not higher. And what we will choose is this quantity over here. So this will be our different f, our f hat. It will be the regular f function minus some constant that we will need to find out times another function minus its expectation. And of course, this becomes this. Let's see what is the expectation of this function. Well, it's just the expectation of the first function minus the constant which we can pull out times the expectation of this. But the expectation of this is zero because it's a number minus its expectation. So of course, the expectation of this is zero. And we get that the expectation of the new function is equal to the expectation of the old function. So basically, this condition is met. What about the variance? If we take the variance of this, so notice we are taking the variance of this thing. This thing is a constant. And if you add or subtract a constant from the variance, it doesn't matter. So we can just ignore it. So we are taking the variance of this function minus a constant times this function. So it will be equal to the variance of this, which is denoted by this, plus the variance of this, we can take a out as a constant, it will just become squared. Okay, so this becomes the variance of this. And now minus two times the covariance of this with this. And because this is a constant, we can pull it out of the covariance and it will be here. Okay, so we have this and this. And if we take it to be a function of a, and we are looking now for the a for this constant that will minimize this, then we can take the derivative of this with regards to a. Here we'll have 2a times this, and here the a will cancel out and we'll get this. If we equate it now to zero, we get that the optimal a is equal to this thing. If we take the second derivative, we get that it's equal to two times the variance, the variance the variance is always non-negative, so this is greater or equal to zero, which suggests that this is a minimum point. And now if we actually plug it into the function, yeah, so if we take g of a star, it's equal to this thing. Yeah, this will become here and here. This will cancel with this. We will have plus this term minus twice this term. Yeah, this will also become two. So we'll just get this thing over here. Notice we have a variance of f, yeah, and sorry, this is the variance of f and not of f hat. So we have the variance of f minus something here which is positive because of the square, something here that is positive because of the variance. So this whole thing is greater than zero. We are reducing, it must be that this is less than this thing over here. And actually we are also assuming here that the variance of h cannot be zero, so this has to be greater than zero. And so it is a minimum point, and the variance of half hat, which is equal to this, will be less than the variance of f. So now this condition is met. What h function, what h of z we are going to choose, we want two things. We want h of z that depends on the variational distribution. And one reason for this is that we want our algorithm to be generic. So we don't want it to be some specific function that is uh, specific to the problem at hand, we want to be able to generalize it as a general purpose algorithm. So one option that is good is to use the variational distribution. So to use something that is of Q of Z, so some function of that. And since we also need the expectation, right? We also need the expectation of it. We want something that we can easily compute the expectation. So one function that complies with these two criteria is the score of Q. So we basically take H of Z to be the derivative of log of q. And since we are calculating everything per parameter, so 
the gradient pair theta i, we are taking this to be only with the log of q theta i. Uh, and then the expectation of this thing, we said it's equal to zero, right? The expectation of the score function is always equal to zero. I showed it twice already just in this video. How do we calculate alpha star? Notice that here we have the covariance between these two functions and the variance of this second function, which we just said will be the score function. We just said it will be this. So what we will do is use MC approximation from the samples that we are sampling anyway. So we are sampling ZIs, right, anyway. We said we are sampling ZSs, sorry. We are sampling them anyway. We can calculate both the F function, which is the original gradient of the elbow, plus the H, which we said will be the score function. So we can calculate it, pair ZI and pair the current value of theta I, and get an approximation of them. So overall, we will denote this gradient with uh, this nabla hat instead of the regular nabla. And it will be equal to the regular gradient minus this a star hat, because we are using MC approximation for it as well, times the h function. And we said that the expectation is equal to 0, so we don't need this. OK, if we put everything together, we get this. And because this is a common term here and here, we can, we can factor it in and be left with the AI in this. So now the full BBVI algorithm, which uses both raw block realization and control variates, will look like this. We draw S samples from the variation family, the full variational family, because we will use different Zs for different gradients. And now for each dimension, we will calculate the gradient with regards to its parameters. And so we calculate the F function, the gradient with the raw block realization. Then we calculate just this as the H function. We calculate the average of the H function. We calculate the average of the F function. We estimate the variance. We estimate the covariance. We calculate A. And now the full elbow is just the F function minus A times the H. This is the gradient that we will use, which leverages both raw block realization and control variates. And now we do gradient descent, where instead of the gradient from before, we use this gradient. And again, instead of this fixed step size, we can use an adaptive step size. And just to show you, this is from a problem that they tested. Um, they used the regular gradient without any variance reduction technique. And you can see that the variance of it is quite high. Yeah, it's the red. Then they used Rao Blackwell and they got the green. If they use Rao Blackwell plus control variates, they get the blue. So it really reduced the variance of the gradients. They also mentioned two extensions in the paper. One is Adagrid, which is basically uh, to have an adaptive step size. This alpha make it adaptive according to the variance of the gradient. I don't want to go into it right now. I think there's a lot of methods about how to choose the step size and it kind of it kind of steps out of the topic that we are discussing right now and it's more regarding optimization and gradient descent in general and they also mentioned that you can also sample data points instead of using the full data so notice that we have the data in our calculations right so in the f function we have this log joint and the log joint has the data as this x and if the data set is too huge we can, instead of using all of the data, use a sample of it. So this is identical to the SVI and the Expo family, where in that algorithm, the stochasticity comes from sampling the data. So in BBVI, you can get the stochasticity both from the MC integration, and if the data set is too huge, you can also sample from it and get the stochasticity also from there. So this is all for this video about BBVI. I hope you enjoyed it and see you in the next one.